We speak a lot in Eye on Yellow Fever about the risk of disease-carrying mosquitoes. But another part of the natural world also requires close monitoring to keep populations safe. All species of non-human primates on the America's continent are susceptible to the yellow fever virus. So when the monkeys get sick, they almost always die. For this episode, we're in Argentina, meeting two experts focused on tracking yellow fever in non-human primates, like monkeys and apes. They're particularly focused on howler monkeys, watching carefully for signs of disease. Howler monkeys are sentinels for yellow fever circulation. As a behavior of these monkeys, they do some big noise, especially male. Uh, it's a behavior when monkeys are affected because yellow fever is circulating, they die. We say that jungle is in silence, you know, because we can't hear you, we can't hear them. Particularly in South America, non-human primates, usually monkeys, are an important predictor of an imminent human yellow fever outbreak. It is common in our region for episodics to appear before human infections, perhaps one or two months earlier, generating an early warning of viral circulation. So that is the first sign that we should be alert. The risk of outbreaks of the deadly disease yellow fever is both significant and growing. This is down to a cocktail of contributing factors, including climate change and increasing pressure on land, greater movement of people, particularly into cities, and a resurgence in a highly connected world of the mosquito species that carries and transmits the disease. Yellow fever may not be the most obvious global public health threat, but it's a disease with no cure and a growing risk that must be taken seriously. We are Eliminate Yellow Fever Epidemics, that's I for short. From the world's most senior public health experts to those on the front line of combating this deadly disease wherever it emerges, we have the inside story on yellow fever's expanding global risk. This is Eye on Yellow Fever. Welcome back. This is Ines Hamem from the World Health Organization's Emergency Response Communications Team. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Eye on Yellow Fever. It's a pleasure to be with you again. We've talked previously about yellow fever in jungle settings. From two episodes ago, here's Dr. Anis Loom from Brazil's Sao Paulo University. In the forest means that we have circulation of yellow fever virus. So they can keep the virus circulate. This is a way to keep the virus circulate in the forest. This recirculation of disease in wildlife, with mosquitoes constantly reinfecting monkeys and other mammals, is a key part of what's known as the jungle or sylvatic cycle of yellow fever. For today's episode, we're back in South America with one team that closely monitors this sylvatic yellow fever cycle to try to prevent its spillover to nearby human populations. My name is Maria Alejandra Morales. I am a biochemist and my greatest expertise is in the diagnosis of arbovirus infections. Dr. Morales works at Argentina's Institute for Human Viral Diseases. As part of her role, she oversees surveillance of yellow fever in non-human primates. My name is Silvina Goenaga. I am a biologist and I work in arboviruses surveillance in vectors, monkeys or in reservoirs. I try to understand how viruses can be in nature, trying to understand which are the cycles and sylvatic cycles for different agroviruses disease. While Dr. Morales is mostly laboratory-based, working with samples and overseeing teams, Dr. Goenaga is out in the field, or more properly, the rainforest. Yes, I'm going to the jungle. I put some clothes that are protective clothes. We can capture monkeys with anesthetic and we obtain blood samples. We do surveillance in a project of research or when we can see the episodic. Then we capture monkeys. That word, episodic, if you're not familiar, refers to a disease outbreak. An outbreak is an episodic if it affects wildlife rather than humans. The word will crop up a few times this episode. 
Capturing monkeys for testing is rarely, if ever, a first step for monitoring yellow fever. It's considered once a number of other warning signs of a probable outbreak have already been identified. When we do a passive surveillance, we can capture mosquitoes, but that happens usually when we are not in outbreak situation. On the other hand, we can do a active surveillance, and that is capture monkeys, take blood samples and study if there are in, with infection or, or maybe we can study which arboviruses is circulating. Usually when you're doing human surveillance, you have somebody who either is showing symptoms or they go to a, a doctor and they say, I have symptoms or, you know, people know there's an out local outbreak somewhere. So they go to this area. How are you alerted to an area? What are the signs that you need to maybe increase surveillance among the monkeys? Is it just when you see monkeys dying unusually? Is that usually the sign that you get? Experts point out that all species of non-human primates on the America's continent are susceptible to the yellow fever virus, especially those of the Aluata chinos, which are the most sensitive. Aluata monkeys, more commonly known as howler monkeys. According to studies, they're the most susceptible of all non-human primates to yellow fever. They succumb to the disease quickly and have a very high mortality rate. So when the monkeys get sick, they almost always die. It is common in our region for episodics to appear before human infections, perhaps one or two months earlier. This allows generating an early warning of viral circulation in the wild environment. It must be an eerie and unpleasant phenomenon to experience. A key characteristic of howler monkeys is that they make a distinctive loud call that fills the rainforest with noise. Howler monkeys are sentinels for yellow fever, viruses, circulation. As a behavior of these monkeys, they call, they do some big noise, especially male, is a behavior when yellow fever is present, they die. And because they have little ability to combat the disease, they die quickly. Experts like Dr. Goenaga look out for this happening and treat it as a trigger to put in place measures to prevent a human outbreak. We say that jungle is in silence, you know, because we can hear them, they die. So that is the first sign that we should be alert and then we can find some animals dead. That is another sign. Worrying signs like these will shift Dr. Goenaga and team from passive to active surveillance, meaning they move to capturing live monkeys humanely to take blood samples and perform tests. We'll be back with Drs. Morales and Goenaga shortly for more on why and how they take samples from non-human primates to stay one step ahead of disease outbreaks, including yellow fever. You're listening to Eye on Yellow Fever from the Global Coalition of Partners working together to end yellow fever epidemics by 2026. That partnership includes Gavi the Vaccine Alliance, UNICEF, the World Health Organization, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the US CDC, and a host of other organizations from around the globe. This is our 15th episode so far. Previous guests we've heard from include Dr. Mike Ryan, who leads the WHO Health Emergencies Program. What are we focused on right now in COVAX? Equitably producing and distributing vital vaccine to populations on the basis of their need and the benefit derived, right? That's exactly what I has been doing. The I strategy really has been one of the runways we've been able to use to, to have COVAX uh, take off. Dr. Kate O'Brien, WHO Director of Immunizations, Vaccines and Biologicals. The I strategy is about having the evidence and having data to direct where vaccines are most needed, especially for anticipating outbreaks. And Professor Oyewali Tomori, President of the Nigerian Academy of Science. One disease can wipe out all of the money you've made from other places. Get your people protected, then they can have good health and your economy can boom. Our episodes share many fascinating insights, delving into yellow fever and wider public health issues from world-leading experts drawn from all over the world. 
Also, we'd love for you to tell your friends and colleagues about us. Word of mouth is so important when it comes to building an audience for a podcast. You can share a link to our episodes with anyone you think would be keen to learn more about yellow fever or who has an interest in infectious diseases. One last thing, you can also follow the podcast so that new episodes are always automatically downloaded to your device. For the second half of today's episode, we rejoin Dr. Morales and Dr. Goenaga. That switch from passive to active yellow fever surveillance, when alarm bells have started to ring, means they will capture and take samples from non-human primates in the rainforest, in this case, howler monkeys. First of all, we can apply the code of best practices of field primatology. We comply the ethics committee of biomedical research. Then we capture and we use techniques that are designed to be less invasive and to preserve the welfare of the animals and the potential stress of them. And then we anesthetic the animals and we collect blood samples by puncture of the femoral vein. If this isn't your field, the femoral vein is a large blood vessel in your thigh. We do tests on these blood samples to know if yellow fever is circulating. Once you've taken the blood sample from a a non-human primate and you've verified that it's positive, what then happens in terms of controlling yellow fever? The protocol for the rapid response teams aims to implement an integrated action framework based on the investigation of suspected yellow fever, sampling for the dead monkeys and virological monitoring. Identify potential risk areas for yellow fever transmission, develop prevention and control actions to avoid the appearance of human cases. Dr. Morales describes an integrated action framework. Keep in mind that outbreaks in non-human primates are early warning signs with likely human infections to follow. Once they're detected, a rapid response is vital. The location where yellow fever is discovered becomes an epicenter for multidisciplinary rapid response teams. The work team must be made up by a specific profiles. On the one hand, people train to take samples from the animals with veterinarians being in charge of the necropsy procedure. The work of biologists and wildlife manager is important also to track more signs of uh, possible episodics in nearby places. Their work includes taking more samples, including from monkeys that have been found dead. That's what's meant by necropsy. Outreach is also undertaken to nearby people who may be at risk to give them vaccinations if needed. And the heightened alert means awareness is stepped up locally. Where a person with a febrile illness may otherwise have been written up as non-specific, it's assessed for yellow fever. Search for febrile cases, surveillance of non-specific acute febrile syndrome, and evaluation of vaccination and immunization coverage at the uh, susceptible populations in areas where the episodic was detected. While some samples are sent away to be worked on at Argentina's National Reference Laboratory, much of this work is carried out on location where the outbreak was discovered. Dr. Morales says care is always taken to ensure this is light touch, with the minimum possible impact on local environment and communities. The work in the field occurs in the place of the zoonotic event. The slogan is not to affect or damage the environment, and to carry out biosafe uh, procedures for both the animals, the environment, and for the workers affected in this task. What we've been talking about this whole episode, mosquitoes infecting non-human primates, is known as the sylvatic or jungle cycle of yellow fever. Because there's no feasible way to interrupt this wildlife infection cycle, yellow fever will always be a risk in jungle settings like these. It's regarded by public health experts as a permanent yellow fever reservoir. It's worth pointing out that the non-human primate surveillance discussed in this episode is only really valuable in South America, 
In Africa, the different species of monkeys and non-human primates are less likely to be killed in large numbers in the presence of yellow fever, so the approaches and tools for episodic oversight are different. Dr. Morales says it's work that requires constant vigilance. We cannot forget the yellow fever risk. Sometimes we have others public health situations like COVID or, or others that you have to attend, but it's necessary to maintain and reinforce all the activities in order to protect our population. She also stresses it's work that has to be done internationally with cooperation across borders. We are working together with the different countries in order to harmonize our protocols and strategies, share information and maintain strong surveillance activities. We are all connected. We need to work together. Thanks very much to Drs. Morales and Goenaga for taking the time to speak to us for this episode. They are from Argentina's Institute for Human Viral Diseases, keeping a watchful and expert eye on yellow fever's sylvatic cycle of transmission. An important reminder before we leave you that word of mouth is so important when it comes to reaching new audiences with podcasts. So if you have colleagues or friends who you think would find this episode useful or interesting, please let them know about us by sending them a link. You can select subscribe or follow to make sure that all future episodes of Eye on Yellow Fever are automatically downloaded directly to your device. Thank you for being with us this time. This episode was produced by Dave Howard with research from Emilia Janssen and sound design by Adam Whaley. I'm Ines Hamem. Eye on Yellow Fever is a Bengo Media production for the Eliminate Yellow Fever Epidemic Strategy. <laughs>